So the mushroom industry is it's pretty big. It's quite big business. It's worth a lot uh, around the world, world uh, per year. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in Britain, we grow about um, 80,000 tons of mushrooms a year, uh, which is actually tiny when you compare it to uh, Poland. Ireland's caught up as well, um, and the Dutch grow a lot of mushrooms too. Um, but our capacity in the UK is also growing at the moment, and um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of money going in, a lot of investment. Um, so it's a good place to be at the moment. Um, so the common mushroom, the the button mushroom, the white mushroom, uh, is actually Agaricus bisporus. I'll probably be talking about Agaricus throughout my talk. Um, so Agaricus is an ideal host for a pathogen. Um, it's the same. Uh, genetic strain used all across Europe. It's grown on a massive scale um, and it's all clonally propagated. So, um, and to give you an idea of this scale, I've got this picture here. So, this fella at the end of this tunnel uh, kind of gives you an idea of, this, of the scale of these tunnels. This is where the mushroom compost is produced. So, the compost is a mixture of straw and manure that's been um, degraded down by bacteria, sterilized, and then um, you add uh, grains of um, agaricus mycelium. So the mycelium, the fungus, grows all the way through these tunnels. So you get hundreds of tons of biomass in a single tunnel, which is all connected. So it's basically a massive viral highway. <clears throat> so one of the biggest uh, problems in the industry um, for a long time, for about 20 years, is uh, Mushroom Virus X. So Mushroom Virus X um, has two different symptoms. Um, so one of the symptoms is this uh, kind of patch or uh, delay in the, the um, development of the, of the mushrooms, of the fruit bodies. Um, and Sometimes you also see this um, browning of the cap. So these two symptoms um, actually popped up in completely different places geographically. Um, and then over the years they've kind of merged and um, at the moment in Ireland the biggest problem is the brown symptom and the delay symptom seems to have um, taken a back step. So before 2012, before we started our project, um, the way that you would diagnose whether or not you had mushroom virus X was by looking at um, the double-stranded RNA content of, this, of the um, fungus. So you'd get this kind of typical pattern where you'd see lots of different bands of double-stranded RNA on a gel, um, and there could be up to 16 different viruses in the same cell. Uh, at least double-stranded RNAs in the same cell, um, and they had a, a wide uh, range in size. Um, the interesting thing is, quite often you wouldn't see the same profile, you wouldn't see the same bands. You'd see some of the same ones, but quite often they'd come with in different varieties. So you might get, um, you might get these two, this one, these and these four, or you might get all of them, or you might just get um, these seven or eight. So it's quite a difficult disease to actually characterize just by looking at the double-stranded RNAs on a gel. Uh, also, you'd need a lot of mushrooms to be able to do this kind, of, this kind of diagnosis. And once you're looking at the mushrooms, it's already too late because, you're, because you've already lost your yield. So uh, in 2012, we started a project um, funded by the EU, basically to improve the, the testing of mushroom virus X. Um, so my task was to um, develop a extraction method from the mushroom compost so that we could predict whether or not the um, mushrooms uh, would have um, viral problems. Um, also we sequenced the um, double-stranded RNAs uh, associated with mushroom virus X 
so that we'd be able to start measuring the viruses, the individual viruses, start characterizing them, start understanding the biology behind these viruses, rather than just looking at these double-stranded RNAs on, uh, on an, an electrophoretic gel. Um, and then we use these two first tasks to actually produce a test. So we, we use quantitative PCR to measure the levels of each of the different viruses in from compost. We can also do it in mushrooms. <coughs> so the first step for me was um, doing next generation sequencing um, on as many of the mushroom virus X samples as I could get my hands on. Um, we managed to get 32 million paired end reads using the MySeq machine. I know some of you are actually interested in next gen sequencing, so I've given you a bit of detail. Um, and we assembled these reads into contigs using Velvet Oasis. Um, that gave us tens of thousands of contigs. Um, we then used CAP3 to um, take out the redundant contigs, which gave us more like 100 or 200 contigs. We then looked at the protein similarity um, of these viral contigs to, um, to compare them to known viruses, to compare them to known proteins in general. And we found that um, 21 of our, 21 of our um, contigs um, came up as hits against viral proteins. Um, only three of those 21 are known. So there's mushroom bacilliform virus, um, there's Agaricus bisporus and Dornavirus 1, which is the only one that's been associated with mushroom virus X previously. Um, and one that's just, um, that just popped up in the literature last year, which is Agaricus bisporus spherical virus 1. Um, we also found 10 RNA satellites that are like, they're, they're quite small. Um, they don't, they, some of them code for proteins. They don't, um, they don't come up as hits against um, the agaricus genome. They're not phages. They're not any kind of contaminant that we can identify. So we believe these to be associated with the viruses. Uh, also, we had some fragments of sequencing um, previously for mushroom virus X, and three or four of these satellites come out as hits for previously sequenced mushroom virus X. This is just a big massive list of the viruses that we've sequenced. Um, you don't need to pay too much attention apart from the fact that they tend to group into um, specific clades um, phylogenetically. Um, <coughs> so um, also many of them have um, viral proteins such as RNA dependent RNA polymerases which are used for replication of viruses. Once again, way too much information. You don't need to be looking at all the detail. Um, the main thing that I want you to take away from this is that we are seeing a minimum of 12 viral RNAs in each of our different samples. Um, and the one with the most has actually 27 different viral RNAs in it. So we're seeing a massive number of viruses in our, in our samples. These are the ones that I. These are the ten that I used for um, the ten mushroom virus X samples that I used for next gen sequencing, um, and you can see the deep green are viruses that, or at least RNAs that you can um, that are just ubiquitous. They're in all of the samples that we check by next gen sequencing. Also by qPCR, we see these virus, We see these RNAs over and over again. So just looking at, the, at these ubiquitous viruses in a bit more detail, um, I can break them down into categories. So we see two hyperviruses. Two of the biggest viruses that we see in there are, are hyperviruses. Um, so hyperviruses uh, basically um, were characterized because they're found in fungal pathogens. So they would cripple fungal pathogens um, and, and stop these fungal infections uh, generally on trees. But in agaricus, these hyperviruses don't seem to do, they don't seem to have symptoms. They don't seem to affect the cells too much. 
We also see some circular um, or repetitive RNAs. These are quite hard to assemble, so we're not sure if they're circular or if they're repetitive. We just know that there's certain segments that repeat over and over again, which is indicative of, um, of circular RNAs. Uh, and these are the ones that I'm really interested in, particularly. I mean, this is an aside. I'm, this isn't for mushroom virus X, but it's really interesting because um, one of these RNAs doesn't code for any kind of protein. It's quite big. It's at 2.3 kb in size. Um, but the really interesting thing about it is it's at massively high proportions in these cells. So it's actually, when you do, we've, we've got microarray data that shows that it's one of the top three most highly expressed uh, RNAs in the cell, which is a massively big deal. That's up there with our RNA. You know, it's just in massive quantities in in agaricus. So it suggests to me that actually it's it's agaricus. It's the host. It's some kind of non-coding RNA that actually has some kind of function. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that's all I'll be talking about on that particular point. <clears throat> so. Getting back to our symptoms, um, we, have, we have brown mushrooms. Um, so when we look at um, the mushroom color and compare it to the, uh, the levels of some of our particular viruses um, by qPCR, then we can see some trends. Um, so C20 has this trend here, which is trends upwards. These are, the, these are particular brown mushrooms. These are white mushrooms. These are in between. Um, so, over here, high levels of virus, here very low levels of virus. So we see a trend, we see a correlation between the levels of this virus, which we've called C20, um, and the brown phenotype. You see an almost identical trend with C22. Um, so there is some evidence, some traditional evidence, to show that these two particular viruses are linked to the brown symptom, or at least two double-stranded RNAs that are the same size as these two double-stranded RNAs um, were linked with brown. When you look at one of the other ones, C4, for example, you don't see any trend. You just see massively high levels of this virus, but you don't see any, uh, there's no particular link with the color of the, of the caps. Um, and this virus C12, which is associated more with delay, um, there are some with high levels, but also with low levels. It doesn't really seem to be associated with colour. Unfortunately, um, we need to do a lot more work to be able to publish these kinds of results. We need a lot more um, positive uh, samples, which our collaborators are very busily producing. <coughs> So now that we can measure all of the viruses um, in compost, um, we can see some trends. So I've categorized, I've categorized these viruses into um, different groupings. So the ubiquitous viruses that we looked at earlier, um, you see them at very high levels in these six um, mushroom samples. In fact, these are compost samples. Um, and the co uh, there are common viruses, there are rare viruses, and there are the brown linked viruses. So there are five of these double-stranded RNAs that are linked to the, the brown symptom. Um, I've highlighted the green sample here in particular because um, that sample is very strongly brown. It's very strongly MVX infected um, and um, this was actually a uh, I was looking at spread of the of the viruses, but we only got it in one in one of the samples. Um, but so this so this scale here, this is um, the higher it is, the more virus there is, um, and um, this is a, a CT scale, so it's it's logarithmic. So in fact, any small difference here is is quite a massive difference, which you can see if you change the numbers a bit um, to reflect more the the uh, the exponential uh, uh, nature of these of these values. So here you can see that just these these um, browning viruses just are at very high levels only in the only in our our um, brown our brown infected compost. So. To get more of an idea about 
um, the epidemiology of these viruses to get more of an idea about how they spread, um, how, how they actually cause symptoms. Um, we took three samples um, along the industry, um, along the, uh, the timeline of industry. So we start with the compost tunnel, so that's, we could call that day zero. Next, that compost is shipped to the grower. It's actually filled onto the shelf on the same day. And then, 21 days later, um, you take compost from underneath symptomatic mushrooms. Um, <coughs> so if you look at the ubiquitous viruses, you don't really say, you see a bit of a change, a bit of a trend down after delivery to the, um, to the growers, but basically the, the levels are maintained. Whereas when you look at the, the brown linked viruses, there are relatively low levels in the compost tunnel, but you can see that it's already infected with these particular viruses. So this is quite interesting. Um, once it gets to, once, so the only difference between here and here is that it's been, um, this tunnel has been unloaded, it's been put on conveyor belts, it's been um, layered into a truck, the truck is driven down the road, um, and then it's all been emptied out again and put on shelves. So there's a lot of kind of um, cell, cell damage basically uh, during transport. And we suspect that this is causing a massive increase in these particular viruses. So then 21 days later, you see a similar level of the viruses um, in, the, in the compost underneath these brown mushrooms. So we believe that these brown linked viruses are causing the brown symptom, but we need more evidence. So another interesting aspect, which is probably causing a lot of confusion. So basically the last 20 years has been spent trying to work out what is going on with these mushroom viruses. There's very little correlation between specific double-stranded RNAs and symptoms. Sometimes you see, you see browns here, but you see whites here. It's very confusing. All of that compost should presumably have the same viral content, but we're seeing different symptoms here than we are even 10 centimeters away. So we're trying to work out why. Why do we see these differences in symptoms? So one of the things that we've looked at is um, we've looked at the viral levels in mushrooms from one week to the next. So the way that mushrooms grow, they have um, they're cased on, let's say, day zero, so there's a, a level, uh, an amount of soil that's put on top of the compost. The mushrooms grow up through that. So after a week, you get your first flush of mushrooms, your first crop of mushrooms. They're all picked off. You water it. One week later, you get another crop of mushrooms. Pick them off, water, another crop of mushrooms. One week later, you tend to get three flushes of mushrooms per um, compost. Um, so we've looked at the first two flushes of mushrooms and it's really interesting because you'd imagine that you'd see the same viruses from one week to the next. But in fact, you see that the levels change quite considerably. So here, for example, we've got one of the viruses which just didn't even appear in the first flush, but it's in massive, massively high quantities in the second flush. This one here is quite, quite similar levels from one flush to the next. But these are the interesting five that, that we like, that we think are um, linked to the brown symptom. And you can see that one of them is very high in flush two, but quite low in flush one. One of them is quite high in flush one, low in flush two. But this pattern, <laughs> it, it's seemingly random. It's, so this is just one of the strains that I've been looking at. Another strain has got exactly the opposite, um, exactly the opposite trend. So you see, um, low levels of this one in the first flush, high levels in the second flush, and then this one here, which is quite similar levels now, would actually be quite high in the second flush, low in the first flush. It's just, it's a bit, it's quite hard to pick apart. So now that we've got the tools to look at the levels of virus, we're very interested in trying to tease apart the, this kind of detail to actually work out why they're causing these symptoms. <coughs> So, my conclusions are that we've come, we have succeeded in our project in developing a qPCR based 
um, detection method um, and we can do it in compost or, or mushrooms. Um, the viruses are highly dynamic, they change quite considerably over a small amount of time um, and they change between developmental stage so when they're mycelia they can be quite different to when they're fruit bodies in mushrooms. Um, the brown link viruses now have a bit of identity. We've got some viral proteins as associated with um, with the two biggest um, RNAs and uh, we also have we've shown that these three are also associated with these viruses. Um, also they tend to appear together. Um, so there's quite, quite strong correlations between their levels and their, co and their incidence, um, suggesting that they, they might actually be a, a single virus. Um, so this is just a series of questions that this, these kinds of conclusions uh, draw. So we need to tackle why, the, why you see such massive differences in these viral levels. Um, there could be lots of different reasons and we need to do some experiments to work it out. Um, <clears throat> also we need to get more evidence about how these viruses are causing the symptoms. So we need to um, look at how th these viruses are interacting with the fungal cells. Um, why would viruses cause the caps to go brown? There's we need to look at the mechanisms behind that browning to really understand it. Okay, and I'd just like to say thank you to uh, the boss, to Kerry Burden, um, also to Greg for uh, doing a lot of this work with me, and for Julie also, she gets all the, all the rubbish work, unfortunately, bless her. Um, and thanks to our collaborators in Ireland. Thank you very much for your attention.